everybody, it's Lee. How you doing? I am here at the office of Citizen Journalism School and The Populist, just a block and a half from the White House. Nice to see everybody coming in. It's a packed office right now. It's, there's so many people. I'm not even going to show because Jack's over there on the floor. But, uh, but so I asked, uh, let me do the usual stuff. Citizen Journalism School, hey, it's a good time to sign up right now. We have our Citizen Journalism and Activism Conference coming up. Uh, and we're clearly being assailed, so that's, that, that's nice. The persecution thing is always good for, for, for letting you know that, that we're over target. Um, uh, and do me a favor, retweet this puppy, let people know. I'm going to be talking about this story for the next few days. So I tweeted yesterday that the New York Times told me that they had a piece coming about my Twin Falls reporting. They've been working on it for months. It came out this morning. Caitlin, the writer, uh, uh, was nice enough to send me a copy. And I, I read it, and I tweeted it out immediately. You can read it yourself. And it's a smear job, and it's a smear job against me, personally. It's a smear job against Breitbart. Who I was working for at the time, uh, and it's a smear job trying to muddy the facts about the Twin Falls story. Now, it is such a smear that unpacking it all is going to take a little while. But here's what I would I would have you note in a big picture sense. Here's the way you smear. The headline of the story is about fake news. Then they go through the story and they say well, Lee, you know, didn't correct things or whatever. But they don't spell out what I needed to correct. And as my, my wife says, that's a tell, right? You'd think it would be easy for them to quote one of my articles. Stranahan said, copy, paste, then refute the facts, right? They don't do it. Uh, what they do instead is they make the broad statement. And I just want you to understand how these smears work. They make the broad statement, then they say they didn't correct. But that's not what happened. They don't do that. And why don't they do that? And, and the other way they smear is they make the complete misstatements. So, for instance, they say that I was sent by Breitbart to, uh, to uncover the Muslim takeover. And then they quote Breitbart saying that they denied it and say it's absurd. So they quote me saying that, and then they quote Breitbart saying it's absurd. Problem. I never said that. I never said I was sent there to cover the Muslim takeover. I've, I've been very consistent on this story the entire time. Breitbart asked me to go. They, Alex Marlowe, my editor at the time, asked me to look into the story because he felt there was something there, but it had been misreported to some extent. The way the story was being reported was a Muslim takeover. And Chobani and Hamdi Yulakaya, who's Chobani Yogurt's owner, remember, Chobani Yogurt has the world's largest yogurt factory, was being characterized as doing a Muslim takeover. I looked into the story, and that was not the story as far as I was concerned. I thought the story very clearly, before I ever went to Twin Falls, was globalism. I looked into Hamdi Yulakaya. He doesn't seem to be a particularly devout Muslim. Uh, he's not a hardcore fundamentalist Muslim in any way I can find. But what immediately strikes out when you no look into Hamdi Yulakaya is he is a hardcore devout globalist. You can see pictures of him at Davos and all these other international things. He pals around with politicians, okay? That's what was obvious, as soon as I researched it, as soon as Alex asked me to. So before I ever went to Twin Falls, I thought the angle was globalism. And I said it to everybody when I got to Twin Falls, I said it to Ann Corcoran, Anne will probably remember the conversation. She's an expert on refugee issues. 
I spoke to Anne when I was in Twin Falls. I said, I think the story is globalism. So, but the way the New York Times reports it is that I was sent there by Breitbart to, to, to look into the Muslim takeover. Not true. Then they quote Breitbart denying what I said, but I never said it. So that's a smear. That's using it. They're being dishonest about what I said. And I've been very consistent on this stuff publicly. So it's easy to, to prove that that's, that's a smear. Then they use Breitbart saying, well, that's absurd, to try to paint this idea that like I'm making claims that Breitbart disputes. Now, there's another claim in there that Breitbart disputes that's also provably true. And I don't know why they disputed that one, which is that Breitbart pulled me off the story under threat from Chobani. Alex Marlowe told me that right before I quit Breitbart this last time. We had a meeting at a coffee shop here in town on K Street where Alex Marlowe said that to my face. And if Alex wants to challenge me publicly on that, he's free to do so. Alex? Now here's what I'm doing about the smear. A couple things. By the way, Alex, I'll, I'll say it again. Anytime you want to dispute that. But by the way, Alex, remember I also have emails. Remember that. I have emails. So if you're doing this to try to make it seem like I'm being dishonest about it, right, think again. Because you not only said it to me, but I have emails, Breitbart. And, and by the way, there's nothing weird about that claim. We know that Chobani actually sued InfoWars. And I was saying it at the time when I was in Twin Falls, anyone following my periscopes. I said it to everyone I dealt with in Twin Falls. Now, here's what we're doing about it. Number one, I've asked Caitlin, Caitlin Dickerson, who's the author of the story, who's very nice. But I've invited her to, be, to come on my radio show tomorrow, Fault Lines. And if she can't make it tomorrow, the next day or the next day, whenever she wants to. So Caitlin is welcome to come on the show, and she and I can have a discussion about some of this stuff. I think that would be best for everybody. I think that's a very good way to do it. Now, I don't like it when elitist journalists don't respond on their reporting. And the other thing we're doing is we're asking Carrie Edwards, who's one of the people from Twin Falls. Carrie's a great guy. And we're going to have him on the show, too. We're asking him to come on the show tomorrow. I think Terry's more likely to, to, to show up. And we'll go through it. I'll, I'll ask him. So, the New York Times, appreciate the publicity. The picture's decent. The picture's okay. Uh, appreciate the publicity. One of the reasons I did this story with the New York Times is as my friend Andrew Breitbart said, I win either way. This is a great chance to prove categorically and systematically how the New York Times deceives its readers. It's a great opportunity to do that. I'm also going to be responding in comments on the story. I'm also going to send a letter to the New York Times Ombudsman detailing the falsehoods in the story and the way that incorrect conclusions were drawn. Let me give you one more. At one point the story says that I wondered whether Sean Berger, the mayor, was uh, promoting Sharia law. Now here's what I can tell you. They don't, they don't have links in the story where they link to where I said that. Uh, apparently I may have said it on the radio. But, let me point out something. I never thought Sean Berger, I'm going to say it again, I never thought Sean Berger was pushing Sharia law. And everybody who is in Twin Falls, and anybody who is following me my reporting, knows I never thought that. So why would I say that? Why would they be able to say, Stranahan wondered? I'll bet when I go back to the original reference, and Caitlin, we're going to ask you where the reference is, so we can go back. I'll bet what I said was, some people are asking whether the mayor is
pushing Sharia law. But what I think is really going on is that he's simply a globalist who's trying to, you know, he's a globalist wannabe who wants to do something that's good for business or something like that. So that's not me wondering. That's me debunking. Right? That's not me wondering. Me wondering is me going, is Sean Berger a, a, a Sharia? I've never thought that that guy knows anything whatsoever about Sharia. Not only that, I said this to a New York Times fact checker when they called the other day. Because the New York Times, they did do a fact check. I said to the fact checker, I don't think that and I don't remember ever thinking that. My thing was always, they're just not interested. They're just not interested in learning anything about Islam. So, it's very interesting. I'll make one other personal note. My wife pointed this out. The article makes a reference to my wife that is completely gratuitous and uh, is a half-truth at best. It's a half-truth. So when we say smear, if you read the article, you'll see it mentions my wife. Try to figure out why my wife is brought up in there at all. Why would you, why does, what, what, I'll tell you what it says. Well, I want to go into de a little detail about this. It says that when I worked for Access Hollywood when I was on the left, I was an erotic photographer. That's true. It doesn't go into any details about that. It doesn't tell you, for instance, and that, by the way, this may or may not make a difference to you personally, but let's go over this because I, I, I want to be clear on it. It makes a difference in the perception of it. It doesn't mention that I was an award-winning erotic photographer whose work was featured in galleries, right? And that I, I was, I was, I worked, I did almost exclusively black and white. This is the 90s. And by the way, nothing, I don't, I don't do this anymore, but I don't care. But it creates an impression. And it says that I met my wife doing that. What it doesn't tell you is that my wife had come over with a friend who was going to pose for me. And my wife was initially came over, I didn't know her at the time, obviously. She came over because she was just going over to make sure her friend was safe or whatever. Then when my wife saw my work, she was like, oh, this guy's an artist. And then my wife posed. And it doesn't mention, for instance, that Playboy.com said that my work is the kind of thing you would hang on your walls if you weren't afraid what your parents would say. So uh, the work that I did was an adult. It was explicit, as was a lot of the art photography. This was like post Maplethorpe, let me put it like this. My work's very different than Maplethorpe's in a lot of ways. Uh, but you know, it's in that, it, it was in a time when uh, erotic photography was being considered as art. And uh, I wasn't uh, far from the only person working in that genre. Robert Gatewood, there were a number of other, Gunter Bloom, there were a number of artists who were working that way. And so that explanation is just by way of saying uh, that's not the impression they give. That's why I say it's a half-truth. That's why I say it's a half-truth. Sort of true, kind of. But it's the same way when people try to smear me, oh, Lee was a pornographer. No, not really. I guess maybe if you look at it one way and you want to define certain words in certain ways, uh, that's, that's fine. But let's be honest about why you're doing it. And there's no explanation about why you would even mention that or my wife in an article. Like, it, does, it just doesn't make any sense. But read it for yourself. Right. Now, that was some people saying statues and nudes. Right. And that was part of the point. And I could do a whole explanation of my artistic philosophy. By the way, most pornographers don't have artistic philosophies that were enumerated, which were. I, I was, so whatever. So anyway, that's, that's that part of it. But again, just ask yourself why it would come up anyway. 
it doesn't, how does it make any sense in a story on Twin Falls? Right? Doesn't. It doesn't. But that's okay. I invite Catherine, uh, Caitlin, forgive me, I invite Caitlin to come on the show. I invite her to engage in a dialogue about it. We're going to have other people from Twin Falls. We'll engage in a dialogue with them about it as well. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm not going to shut up. And I'm not going to continue to do accurate, fact-based journalism that they can't and don't even try to dispute. Period. Let me give you one more example. They're critical of me using the phrase horrific gang rape to describe the sexual assault of a five-year-old girl by three boys, two adolescent and one teenager, where she was, this is going to get salty, but not too explicit, let me put it that way, where she was penetrated orally, vaginally, and anally, and urinated on. Okay. I'm going to say that again. And, and by the way, and they videotaped it. So, two adolescents and a teen orally, vaginally, and anally penetrated a slightly mentally challenged five-year-old girl, developmentally disabled in some ways, five-year-old girl, shot it with their phone, video that I reported their father saw. Now, which part, which word of the three-word phrase, horrific gang rape, does the New York Times disagree with? Gang? There were three people involved. So you, you can't disagree with gang. It wasn't one person. Right? Rape? There was penetration. Horrific? Is that where the New York Times wants to make it bones on this story? Does anybody listening, what, what was it, New York Times? Caitlin, what was it? Was it an awesome, what was it? An awesome sexual assault by innocent, what was it? I don't think horrific gang rape is an incorrect phrase. I don't think it's inaccurate in any way. Do you? Now, they don't challenge the facts of what I'm saying because those are the facts. Instead, they diminish what happened to that young girl. That's what the New York Times is doing. And that's one of the reasons I got involved in this story is I saw the media diminishing what happened to her. By the way, do you think if this had been a refugee girl and the boys had been wearing Trump hats, do you think they would hesitate to call it and exactly everything that happened happened? Do you think they'd hesitate to call it a horrific gang rape? Do you think they'd hesitate for a second to do that? So, uh, this, is, this is one of those places where uh, the New York Times and liberalism in general, what, you're pro-woman? You're anti-sexual assault? Really? Really? Is that what you're doing? I'd like to hear an explanation as to which word you didn't think applied. Could I call it a horrific group sexual assault? You want to quibble about rape versus sexual assault? Given what, and, and feel free to do so. Because I talked to the parents who said there was penetration involved. That's what I talked to. Was it charged as a rape? No. It was not charged as a rape. What does that tell you? I don't know. What it tells me 
and there's a number of other reasons I would say this, is politics played a part in the charging. Now, by the way, did I say it's the most horrific sexual crime that I've ever... No, it's not. It's not the most horrific sexual crime I've ever heard of or been aware of. There's worse incidents that happened in Twin Falls, I'm sure. I never said it was the most horrific gang rape ever to occur in Twin Falls. But to diminish it is it says quite a bit about the way the New York Times approaches this story. So, I'm not going to shut up about it. I'm not going to stop talking about it. I invite dialogue about it. I invite the journalist, Caitlin, I invite you to explain which word in horrific gang rape you disagree with. I want to hear. I think, would, would, you, would you like to hear that as a reader? Would everybody here like to hear them explain that one? Because I really would. There we go. I emailed that message to her on Twitter. What's that? I emailed that message to Caitlin on Twitter. Okay. So, so Caitlin's been contacted. She knows. Producer Eric has been contacted. And again, Caitlin talked. Did Feel free. But that, and like I say, and that's one of the reasons I did this story, and I gave a, a lot of my time, as much time as they wanted. I did not turn on it, the interview request. I took it and everything else. This is a good example to find out. So do me a favor, retweet this, share this. We're not going to stop talking about it. Love you guys. Appreciate your time. Bye.